نستعينه ونستغفره نحمده ونستعينه ونستغفره ونعوذ بالله من شرور انفسنا ومن سيئات اعمالنا من يهده الله فلا مضل له ومن يضلل فلا هادي له واشهد ان لا اله الا الله وحده لا شريك له واشهد ان محمدا عبده ورسوله يا ايها الذين امنوا اتقوا الله حق تقاته ولا تموتن الا وانتم مسلمون يا ايها الناس اتقوا ربكم الذي خلقكم من نفس واحده وخلق منها زوجها وبث منهما رجالا كثيرا ونساء واتقوا الله الذي تساءلون به والارham ان الله كان عليكم رقيبا يا ايها الذين امنوا اتقوا الله وقولوا قولا سديدا يصلح لكم اعمالكم ويغفر لكم ذنوبكم ومن يطع الله ورسوله فقد فاز فوزا عظيما اما بعد فان اصدق الحديث كتاب الله وخير الهدى هدى محمد صلى الله عليه وسلم وشر الامور محدثاتها وكل محدثه بدعه وكل بدعه ضلاله وكل ضلاله في النار Alhamdulillah we praise Allah and we seek his assistance and we seek his forgiveness and we seek refuge in Allah from the evil within ourselves and from our bad deeds wherever Allah guides there is none that can lead him astray and wherever is that astray and there is no guide for him I bear witness that no god has the right to be worshiped other than Allah he is alone and has no partners and I bear witness that Muhammad is his slave and his messenger O you who believe fear Allah as you ought to be feared and don't die except as Muslims O humanity fear your Lord who has created you from a single soul and created from it its mate and scattered from them too many men and women and fear Allah from you demand your mutual rights and don't cut off relations with the wombs that bore you indeed Allah is a raqib over you O you who believe fear Allah and say that which is correct in order that he may accept from you your deeds and forgive you of your sins and whoever obeys Allah and his messenger has achieved the greatest achievement amma ba'du certainly the most truthful speech is the book of Allah and the finest guidance is the guidance of Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam and the most evil of, of affairs are newly invented matters in this deen and every newly invented matter in this deen is a bid'ah and every bid'ah is a string and every string is in the fire <coughs> today we are with uh, Usul al-Sunnah by, al- by the Imam Al-Humaydi Rahimahullah And we're taking this from the book Aqaidu Aimmatu Salaf Or the Aqeedahs of the Imams of the Salaf By <coughs> Fawaz Ahmed Zamarli And he brings the introduction as he says Inna alhamdulillah na'hamaduhu wa nasta'inuhu wa nasta'gfiruhu Wa na'udhu billahi min shuroori anfusina min sayyati amalina Man yahdihi allahu fala mudilla lah Wa man yudlil fala hadiya lah Wa ashadu an la ilaha lallahu wahdahu la sharika lah Wa ashadu anna muhammadan Wa ashadu anna muhammadan rasulullah Sallallahu alayhi wa ala alihi wa sahbihi Wa man attaba'a sunnatahu bi ihsanan ila yawmuddin amma ba'du This is the fifth uh, small thesis of this series That I have decided uh, to prepare for my brother readers Seeking the assistance in Allah al-Aliyul Qadir That I might make a good preparation in this And this risala or this small thesis is by an imam from the imams of hadith and that imam ahmad rahimahullah he said al humaydi indana imamun al humaydi in our opinion is an imam and he has in this thesis written down the basis of the sunnah in light of the position of ahl sunnah the positions or the basic fundamentals that they all believe as their aqeedah and even though it is small in its size in its size it is very beneficial in the chapter of aqeedah i tried my best to make this series of small thesis to be from amongst the biggest imams and to keep them from being Uh, to keep these theses from being very long and lengthy so that they might be easy for the people to understand and benefit from and I ask Allah to accept this action or this deed from me and to give me the success to do what is pleasing to him and what he is satisfied with Walhamdulillah Rabbil Alameen Before we begin with the Usul Sunnah 
wa the aqida of al humaydi we just want to give a small biography of the imam he is al <coughs> imam al alam al hafiz al faqih he is the imam one of the signs of islam one of the memorizers and one of the people who are strong in his fiqh or understanding of the deen he is the sheikh al haram or the sheikh of the al masjid al haram in mecca his name is Abdullah ibn Zubair al Qurashi al Asadi al Humaydi al Makki, and he is the author of a Musnad called Musnad al Humaydi, which has been published, uh, alhamdulillah, in two volumes. And at the end of those two volumes is where they have this aqidah of al Humaydi, rahmatullahi alayhi. Al-Humaydi, he learned from Sufyan ibn Uyayna and Muslim ibn Khalid and Fudayl ibn Iyad and Ad-Darawardi and he is considered to be from amongst the biggest scholars or from amongst the biggest companions of Imam al-Shafi'i rahimahullah. Imam al-Bukhari narrates on Al-Humaydi and Al-Zuhli and Abu Zur'a and Abu Hatim and Bishr ibn Musa and a whole group of others. Uh, just for our knowledge, Sufyan that we've mentioned, Sufyan ibn Uyayna, we've done his aqidah before, walhamdulillah. And Imam al Bukhari, his aqidah has been done and it's published, walhamdulillah. Abu Zur'a and Abu Hatim, we did their aqidah uh, before, walhamdulillah, as we're doing the aqidah of Al Humaydi rahimullah. Imam Ahmed, as we mentioned before, said Al Humaydi is an Imam in our position. And the aqeedah of Imam Ahmed rahimullah has also been published, his Usul Sunnah. And there are some other short theses of uh, Imam Ahmed that we will do, inshaAllah ta'ala, around the subject of the aqeedah. Al Fasawi, he says that I have never met anyone who gives better nasiha to Islam and the people of Islam than al Humaydi? He died in Mecca in the beginning uh, of the day on Monday, 219 Hijra, and some people say 220 Hijra. And there are some other statements about al Humaydi, and we'll take them inshallah from Sira Alam al Nubala by Imam al Dhahabi or the biographies of the rich and famous in Islam. Al-Humaydi, the, uh, you find him in the narrations of Imam al-Bukhari and Abu Dawood in the Sunan of Abu Dawood and also at tirmidhi and Al-Nasai. And this is to show the strength of Al-Humaydi that he's mentioned in the chains of the most famous collections of hadith. His name is Abdullah ibn Zubair ibn Isa ibn Ubaidullah ibn Usama ibn Abdullah ibn Humayr ibn Zuhair ibn Harith ibn Asr ibn Abdul Uzza and some of them say that his grandfather is Isa ibn Abdullah ibn Zubair ibn Ubaidullah ibn Humayr he is the imam the memorizer the faqih he is the sheikh of the haram his kunya is Abu Bakr al Qurashi al Asadi al Humaydi al Makki the author of the Musnad of Al-Humaydi and that's a two volume collection of hadith but some of the people said man he has a long name that's only saying he's, his name is Abdullah the son of Zubair the son of Isa the son of Ubaidullah this is the mentioning of his lineage and the Muslims usually have one name and then they're the son of their father's name and like that uh, the people that he narrates on, as these are some of the names of the people we've mentioned before, Fudayl ibn Uyab, and Sufyan ibn Uyayna, and Waqi'ah, and Imam al-Shafi'i. And he's not from amongst the people who has narrated many hadith, but though he's only narrated a few hadith, he's considered one of the biggest personalities in Islam because of his weightiness and his knowledge of Islam. The people who narrate on him are Al-Bukhari, like if uh, in some of the narrations that we have read before from the books of our Shaykh Musaf ibn Adawi, he says, Imam al-Bukhari says, Haddathan al-Humaydi. And this is the Shaykh of Imam al-Bukhari al-Humaydi, 
rahmatullahi alayhi. He also, the people who narrate on him is Abu Zura al Razi and Bishr ibn Musa and Abu Hatim, amongst the names that we already mentioned. Abu Hatim, he said, the person who is strongest in his narration on Sufyan ibn Uyayna is Al Humaydi. He is the president of the companions of Sufyan ibn Uyayna and he is reliable and an imam. An imam, they uh, usually mean an imam meaning that his knowledge of this deen is so much that it's enough to lead the people down the Salatul Mustaqeem to Jannah and away from the hellfire. Not the imam, that meaning the one who leads the Salat and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows best. Al Humaydi, he said, I sat with Sufyan ibn Uyayna for 19 years or about that many years. Uh, you have to refer back, if we refer back to the Aqid of Sufyan ibn Uyayna, just to know the caliber of Sufyan, rahmatullahi alayhi. Uh, then you would see the virtue of Al Humaydi sitting with Sufyan for 17 years, or excuse me, 19 years, or about that time. Also, there's a point here, and we see that Al Humaydi is bragging that he sat with his Sheikh for that amount of time. And us, wala hawla wala illa billah, we sit one year or four years or five years. Allahu Musta'an. Al Humaydi, he also has narrations in the introduction to Sahih Muslim. And the scholars of Hadith, they usually separate the Sahih Muslim into two sections the Muqaddima and the Sahih Muslim, or the introduction to the Sahih Muslim and the Sahih Muslim. In English, they don't translate the introduction, they just translate the Sahih Muslim. But in Arabic, there's an introduction to his Sahih Muslim, and he brings some other narrations, and Al Humaydi are in some of those narrations. Muhammad ibn Sahal al-Quhustani he says that it was narrated to us by Rabi' ibn Sulaiman who said that I heard a Shafi'i rahimahullah say I've never saw a person uh, uh, with a cold for lack of better words that memorizes as much as Al-Humaydi he used to memorize 10,000 hadith of Sufyan ibn Uyayna. And Muhammad ibn Ishaq al-Marwazi, he said that I heard Ishaq ibn Rahway, he's the companion of Imam Ahmad, rahimahumullah, he says that the Imams during our time are two, or the Imams during our time are three, al-Shafi'i, al-Humaydi, and Abu Ubaid. Ali ibn Khalaf, he said that I heard Al-Humaydi say, so long as I am in the Hijaz, and Ahmed ibn Hanbal is in Iraq, and Ishaq is in Khurasan, then no one can conquer us. Abu al-Abbas al-Sarraj, he says I heard Muhammad ibn Ismail, and that's Imam al-Bukhari rahimahullah say, Al-Humaydi, is an imam in hadith and al farab and al farab and al farabri and al farabri says it was narrated to me by muhammad ibn muhallab al bukhari who said that it was narrated to us by al humaydi that he said i swear by allah I swear by Allah to wage war against those who reject the hadith of the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam is more beloved to me than waging war against the kuffar called the atraq. No. Imam al-Dhahabi rahimahullah he says when a shafii died Al-Humaydi wanted to take the place of Imam al-Shafi'i Rahimahullah So he competed him and Ibn Abdul Hakam For that position that Imam al-Shafi'i Rahimahullah used to hold And Ibn Abdul Hakam won and became the Imam of the circles after al-Shafi'i 
and Humaydi rahimullah he went back to Mecca and then he stayed there spreading the knowledge may Allah show his mercy on him Imam al-Shafi rahimullah he was in Egypt at the end before his death rahmatullah alayhi those are some of the statements around Imam al-Humaydi uh, rahmatullah alayhi and now we come to his aqidah where Bishr ibn Musa said that it was narrated to me he said that Al-Humaydi narrated to me, he said, the sunnah and my position is that a man believes in the qadr, the good of it and the bad of it, the sweet of it and the sour of it. And that he knows that what is going to happen to him is not going to pass him by. And that what passed him by was not going to happen to him. And that all of that is by the decree of Allah Azza wa Jal. And that Al-Iman is a statement and action, it increases and decreases. And that a statement doesn't benefit without actions. And actions and a statement doesn't benefit without intentions. And actions and statements and intentions will not benefit except that it's in accordance with the Sunnah. And mercy is to be shown on the companions of Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam, each and every one of them, because indeed Allah Azza wa Jal said, "والذين جاء والذين جاءوا من بعدهم يقولون ربنا اغفر لنا ولإخواننا الذين سبقونا بالإيمان." From the ayah from Surah Al-Hashr, verse number ten, where Allah says, "And those who come after them, they say." After them, referring to after the Sahaba, they say, Our Lord, forgive us and our brothers who preceded us in Al-Iman. And we have not been commanded except to seek forgiveness for them, meaning for the Sahaba, and never to insult them. And whoever insults them or hates them or anyone from amongst them, then he is not on the Sunnah. And he does not get any of the fay, the war booty. As it was reported to us by more than one person on the authority of Malik ibn Anas, rahmatullah alayhi, that he said, Allah Ta'ala has divided up the war booty when he said, لِلْفُقَرَاءِ الْمُهَاجِرِينَ الَّذِينَ أُخْرِجُوا مِن دِيَارِهِمْ Allah Ta'ala says, and this is in Surah Al-Hashr, verse number 8, where Allah says, for the poor from amongst the muhajireen who were kicked out of their homes. And then Allah says, وَالَّذِينَ جَاءُوا مِنْ بَعْدِهِمْ يَقُولُونَ رَبَّنَا اغْفِرْ لَنَا وَلِإِخْوَانِنَا To the end of that ayah that we quoted already from Surah Al-Hashr. Where Allah says, and those who have come after them, they say, our Lord forgive us and forgive our brothers. So whoever does not say this for the Sahaba, and he is not from amongst those people who get any war booty. And the Qur'an is the speech of Allah. And I heard Sufyan say, the Qur'an is the speech of Allah. And he said, it is, whoever says that it is created, then he is a mubtadi'. And I've never heard anyone say that. The Qur'an meaning that the Qur'an was created. And I heard Sufyan say, Iman increases, Iman is a statement and action, it increases and decreases. So his brother Ibrahim ibn Uyayna, he said to, to Sufyan, O Abu Muhammad, don't say it decreases. So Sufyan got angry and he said, be quiet little boy. Iman decreases so much so until there's none left at all. And we believe in the, in the sight after death or the seeing of Allah Ta'ala after death. And we believe in that which the Qur'an states and the Hadith states. Like the statement of Allah Ta'ala, وَقَالَتِ الْيَهُودُ يَدُ اللَّهِ مَغْلُولَةِ غُلَّتْ أَيْدِيهِمْ From Surah Al-Ma'idah, verse number 64, where Allah says, And the Jews say the hands of Allah are tied up, their hands are tied up. 
and the statement of Allah was samawatu matawiyatun biyamine from Surah Al-Zumar verse 70, 67 where Allah says and the heavens are folded up in his right hand and ayat that are resemble this from the Quran and hadith we don't add anything to it and we don't explain it but we stop where the Quran and the Sunnah stops and we say Ar-Rahman al arsh istawa and we say Ar-Rahman rose ab- high above his throne and whoever thinks other than this then he is a mu'attalun jahmi and we do not say that which the khawarij says when they say whoever commits a major sin then he has become a kafir or he has disbelieved and we do not make Muslims kuffar because of their sins Kufr is in leaving the five pillars. Those that the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, Bunya al Islam wa ala khams, shahadati Allah ilaha illallah wa anna Muhammadan rasulullah wa iqamu salati wa itaz zakati wa sawmi ramadan wa hajjil bayt. And this is from the hadith of Al Bukhari al Muslim and also Al Humaydi. Where the Prophet sallallahu says Islam is based on five pillars To bear witness to la ilaha illallah And that Muhammad is the messenger of Allah To establish the salah and to pay the zakah And to fast on the month of Ramadan And to make hajj to the house And as far as Three of these pillars Then there's no debate about leaving them off the one who doesn't bear witness, the one who doesn't make the salat, and the one who doesn't fast. And that is because these things cannot be delayed outside of their time. And it is not permissible that someone makes them up if he was neglectful or uh, intentionally neglecting to perform these acts of worship during their times. As far as zakat is concerned, then whenever a person pays a zakat, then it is sufficient for him. And if he delays it, then he is a sinner. And as far as the hajj is concerned, then it is, then whoever it is compulsory upon, and he finds the, and he has the ability to make the hajj, then it is compulsory on him. The Shaykh says, وَلَا يَجِبُ عَلَيْهِ فِي عَمَّةِ ذَلِكَ حَتَّى لَا يَكُونَ لَهُ مِنْهُ بُدٌ I thought I knew before. Allah knows best. Uh, the Shaykh continues as he says after that. So whenever someone performs the Hajj, then he has fulfilled his obligation. And he is not considered a sinner for delaying it after he performs it. As he was a sinner in the performance of the zakat. And that is because the zakat is a right of the poor Muslims. And he held it against him. And because of that he was a sinner until the wealth was given to them. As far as the hajj, then this is something that is between him and between his Lord. So whenever he does it, then... He has fulfilled his obligation. And if he dies, having the ability to make the hajj and doesn't, then he will ask for a return to the dunya to make the hajj. And it becomes an obligation on his family to make the hajj for him. And we hope that if they do so, then it will be sufficient for him, just as 
uh, if they paid his deen after his death, it would be sufficient. And this is the end of the aqidah of al Humaydi. Uh, rahmatullahi alayhi. The Shaykh he brings a, a basic explanation to the aqidah of al Humaydi, and we'll bring this explanation, inshaAllah. Tabarak wa ta'ala. The one who narrates this aqidah on al Humaydi is Bishr ibn Musa, and he is the Imam al Hafiz. Reliable, who lived a long life, Abu Ali Bishr ibn Musa ibn Salih ibn Shaykh ibn Umayra al Asadi al Baghdadi. He was born. He uh, he was born on 190 Hijra, and Al Khatib al Baghdadi says that he was reliable and trustworthy. He was intelligent, firm, steady, and confident. And Abu Bakr al Khalal al Faqi, he says that Ahmed ibn Hanbal used to respect Bishr ibn Musa and ad dara Qutani said that he was reliable and he died in the year 288 Hijra and he was 98 years old he narrates this aqidah on Al-Humaydi Rahimahullah Al-Humaydi Rahimullah he says and it's for the man to believe in the qadr the good of it, the bad of it the sweet of it and the sour of it. And the Shaykh Fawaz, he adds, as he says, Iman in the Qadr is a pillar from the, or is an article from the articles of Iman. And it's from the basic, uh, it's from the basic fundamentals of our Aqidah in Al Iman and from the fundamentals of this Deen. And from the, uh, Chapters of the Tawheed of Allah and His Rububiyyah. And many of the people have strayed in this issue of Qadr. As they have denied the Qadr of Allah over all things. As they have said that Allah did not create the actions of His servants. So they have taken these actions outside of the Qadr of Allah and His creation. And Qadr, it is informing about the knowledge of Allah, that which, uh, that which Allah knows about the deeds of His servants and what they will earn for themselves. And that this Qadr comes from the decree of Allah subhanahu and his creation and he created it, the good of it and the bad of it. And the Qadr, it is that which has these four pillars. Knowledge, the writing down of it, uh, the will of Allah and the creation. The knowledge means the knowledge of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala of everything before it happens. And the writing down of it is with Allah Ta'ala. And the will means that nothing will come into existence except by the will of Allah. So what He wills is and what He doesn't will isn't. And the creation that Allah created all of the deeds and He allowed them to come into existence. And then Al-Humaydi he says, and I, you should know that what is going to happen to you is not going to pass you by, and what is going to pass you by was not going to happen to you. On the, on the authority of Ibn Daylami, he says that I had a problem with this issue of Al-Qadr, and I feared that it would destroy my deen and my final abode. So I came to Ubay ibn Ka'ab radiallahu anhu and I said to him, O oh Abu al-Mundir, indeed I have something in my chest about this issue of Qadr. And I fear for my deen and my final abode. So narrate to me something about Qadr. So that perhaps Allah might benefit me by that. So he said, if Allah was to punish the people of the heavens and the people of the earth, then he would have punished them and he would have not been oppressive to them. 
And if he would have showed his mercy on them, then his mercy for them is then his mercy on them is better for them than their own deeds. And if you would have had the likes of the mountain of Uhud in gold, or the like of the mountain of Uhud, and you gave it for the sake of Allah, fi sabilillah, it would not be accepted of you until you believed in the Qadr. So I want you to know that what will happen to you, there's no way to pass it by. And what will pass you by, there's no way that it could have happened to you. And if you die on other than this, then you will enter the hellfire. And I advise you that you would see my brother Abdullah ibn Mas'ud radiallahu anhu and you will ask him a similar question. He said, so I came to Abdullah ibn Mas'ud radiallahu anhu and I asked him. And I mentioned to him the likes of what I mentioned to Ubay. And he said to me, Uh, and he, uh, excuse me, I asked Abdullah ibn Mas'udin and he answered me just like Ubay ibn Ka'ab answered me. And then afterwards he said to me that you should go to Hudayfa. So I came to Hudayfa and I asked Hudayfa and Hudayfa said the same thing that both of them said to me. And then he said, go to Zayd ibn Thabit. So I asked Zayd ibn Thabit and he said, I heard the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam say, لو أن الله عذب أهل سماواته وأهل عرضه لعذبهم وهو غير الظالم لهم ولا رحمهم لكانت رحمته خيرا لهم من أعمالهم ولو كان لك مثل ولو كان لك مثل أحد ذهب أو مثل جبل أحد ذهب تنفقه في سبيل الله ما قبل منك حتى تؤمن بالقدر كله فتعلم أن ما أصابك لم يكن ليخطئك وما أخطأك لم يكن ليصيبك وأنك إن مت على غير هذا دخلت النار and this is collected by Abu Dawood ibn Majin, Ahmed ibn Hibbam and others and it is authentic where Zayd ibn Thabit رضي الله عنه he said that I heard the messenger of Allah صلى الله عليه وسلم say if Allah was to punish the people of the heavens and the people of his earth, then he would have punished them and he would have not been oppressive to them. And if he would have showed his mercy on them, then his mercy is better for them than their own deeds. And if they would have had the likes of Uhud as gold, or the mountain of Uhud as gold and gave it fi sabilillah, it would not be accepted from you until you believed in all of the Qadr and that you know that what was going to happen to you wasn't going to pass you by and that was what was going to pass you by wasn't going to happen to you and that if you died on other than that then you would enter the fire <coughs> and then al humaydi he says an iman is a statement and actions it increases and decreases and the shaykh Fawaz he adds he says this statement of the Salaf that Al-Iman is a statement and an action it increases and decreases they all agree upon this they say that it increases with obedience and it decreases with sin disobedience and they use the Quran and the Sunnah as their evidences and the Imam Al-Tabari Rahimahullah he says indeed that which is correct from the statements is the statement that the people say about Iman, that it is a statement and actions, it increases and decreases, and this is what we find a group of people narrating from the companions of the Messenger وسلم, and this is what we found the people of deen and virtues to be upon, and this is the Sariha Sunnah. And we hope inshallah ta'ala that we have a chance to cover the aqeedah of Imam al-Tabari which is called the Sariha Sunnah where we just took this quote from. And some of the people who are mubtadi'ah they oppose this position and they say that Iman doesn't increase and it doesn't decrease. And Al-Awza'i rahimahullah he was asked about Iman and he said Al-Iman increases and decreases. And whoever thinks that Iman doesn't increase and it 
doesn't increase and it doesn't decrease, then he is a person of bid'ah. And Yaqub ibn Sufyan, he says, Al-Iman, uh, in the viewpoint of Ahl Sunnah, is sincerity to Allah or Al-Ikhlas to Allah in your heart and on your tongue and with your body parts. And it is a statement in actions, it increases and decreases. And this is what we found all of the people that we met during our time, during our times in Mecca, in Medina, in Sham, in Basra, and Kufa. And then he mentioned all of their names. And Sahal ibn Mutawakkil ibn Hajar al-Shaybani, he said, I met over 1,000 teachers. All of them used to say, Al-Iman is a statement in actions, it increases and decreases, and the Qur'an is the speech of Allah, and it's not created, and I wrote this position down from them. And then the Shaykh Fawaz, he says, to take a look at uh, some of the other books to see that this position is mentioned in the Aqidas of the Salaf. And then the Shaykh Al-Humaydi, he continues as he says, and your statement will not benefit you without actions. And your actions and your statement will not benefit you except with intentions. And that your statement and actions and intentions won't benefit you until it's in accordance with the sunnah. Fawaz, he says that, Al-Awza'i rahimahullah, he says that your iman is not straight until you have a statement. And that your iman is not straight with a statement alone until it has actions. And that your iman is not straight with statements and an action except with intentions and being in accordance with the sunnah. And he said those people from amongst the salaf who have passed away before us, they've never separated al-iman. Actions is from iman and iman is from actions. And Imam al-Shafi rahimahullah he says, there is a consensus from amongst the Sahab and the Tabi'un and those who came after them from amongst the people who we met and that is that Iman is a statement and actions and intentions and that one of them is not sufficient without all three of them. And then al Humaydi he says to show mercy on the companions of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Fawaz he narrates Habibullah that this means that if we took, talked bad about the Sahaba that some serious things uh, would take place or something like that and he says firstly uh, if you talk bad about the Sahaba and you don't show the mercy on the Sahaba then firstly what you would be doing is Lying, you would be denying the Quran al Kareem that has praised the Sahaba and spoke highly of them in many of the ayat, and that you would be doubting Allah Azza wa Jal, and that He has not chosen good companions for His Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam to guard Him and protect Him after Him, and you would be doubting your Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam that he didn't do a good job in raising the Sahaba and planting the good aqidah in their hearts and you would be snatching away the reliability of all of the narrations of the Sahaba radiallahu anhum that they narrated about this deen and you would be denying the deen altogether that which Allah azza wa jal has wanted for us to be the de- have wanted for the people to be the deen from now on to the last hour. <coughs> and uh, he makes another statement. Allah knows best what he means. And you would be denying the fact that Allah has established the evidences and the proof against the people. These are just some of the things that would stem from not showing mercy on the Sahaba. And then al Humaydi continues as he says, Indeed Allah Azza wa Jal, he said, (coughs) 
And those who come after them, they say, Our Lord, forgive us and forgive our brothers who preceded us in Iman. And we have not been commanded except to seek forgiveness for the Sahaba. And whoever uh, talks bad about them, or whoever hates them, or anyone from amongst them, then he is not upon the Sunnah, and he would not get any of the war booty. Or he would not have any right for the war booty. And it was informed to us by other, other than... For more, for more than one person on the authority of Malik, Malik ibn Anas that he said that Allah has divided up the war booty when he said for the poor muhajirun who were kicked out of their homelands and then Allah said and those who come after them they say our Lord forgive us and forgive our brothers to the end of that ayah so whoever doesn't say this then they have no right to the war booty and the Quran is the speech of Allah and the Shaykh Fawaz, he mentions under this uh, He just mentions the statement of Imam Ahmed and his Usul Sunnah And since that's translated, there's no need to mention that, we'll continue <coughs> uh, He said, I heard Sufyan say, the Qur'an is the speech of Allah I just wanted to stop here for a minute, inshaAllah ta'ala Al-Humaydi in his short aqidah He establishes his point Where he says The Quran is the speech of Allah And then after it he brings his evidence I heard Sufyan say The Quran is the speech of Allah And this was the way Of our Salaf al-Salih That they learned the deen From the reliable people who came before them And that they felt comfortable To be upon what the scholars of Islam was upon who came before them. Just like we saw last week with the aqidah of Sufyan al-Thawri rahimahullah. And that his student, Shu'ib, he was happy to meet his Lord with what Sufyan al-Thawri gave him. And we see the same thing with al-Humaydi. He was happy that his Shaykh Sufyan ibn Uyayna, what he gave him he was happy with and it was sufficient enough for him. And this is the way of the people who follow the Salaf al-Salih What the scholars of this deen Have brought them with Have brought for them Was sufficient for them And that they were happy with what The scholars of this deen have brought with them before And this is the way that we should be And not like many of the people Who brag that <coughs> I didn't have to go nowhere Or sit with nobody to understand it's not When the people who came before us All they wanted to say was I learned this from so and so as al Hamidi said, I sat with Sufyan ibn Uyayna 17 years. And that this was sufficient enough for him to say that he understood Islam, that he hung around Sufyan ibn Uyayna for 17 years. And not to be like many of us are nowadays, we feel that we understand Islam even if we haven't sat with anybody. And we feel that our own understanding of the Quran and the Sunnah is the best understanding. Wala hawla wa la quwwata illa billah. At any rate, he continues as he says that Sufyan said, whoever says that the Qur'an is created is a mubtadi'. And I, ever, I haven't heard anyone before making those type of statements. And Sufyan, he said, I heard Sufyan say that iman is a statement and an action, it increases and decreases. And then his brother Ibrahim ibn Uyayna, he said, O oh, Abu Muhammad, don't say that it decreases. So he got angry and he said, be quiet little boy, it decreases so much so until there's none left. <coughs> and then Al-Humaydi, he says... <coughs> Let me just back up inshallah Sufyan ibn Uyayna Rahmatullahi alayhi When he was establishing this aqidah of the salaf And he saw his brother deny a part of this aqidah He got angry And then he told him to be quiet And then he went on to explain in even more detail That not only does your iman decrease But it decreases so much so Until there's no iman left and that is because Iman is obedience. 
to Allah and His Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam or Iman is a statement in action and increases with obedience and it decreases with disobedience until you might have so much disobedience that you have no Iman may Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala save us but this was the position of Ahl Sunnah and the people of our Salaf al-Salih that they used to defend this Aqeedah Walhamdulillah Rabbil Alameen Al-Humaydi he says and we establish the seeing of Allah in the hereafter and the Shaykh Fawaz, he says that the people of the truth, they agree. And the people of a tawheed and sincerity, they are united upon the position that Allah will be seen in the hereafter. The believers will see their Lord with their eyes on Yawm Al-Qiyamah. And a group of the Mu'tazila and the Jahmiyyah and the Khawarij and others of them deny that we will see Allah. And the aqidah, and this point of aqidah has been established by the Quran and the Sunnah and the Ijma. And then the Shaykh refers. the books that we can refer to the evidences of this position but it's sufficient for us what has been uh, what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala himself says when he says وَجُوهٌ يَوْمَ إِذَنْ نَاظِرَ إِلَىٰ رَبِّهَا نَاظِرَ in Surah Al-Qiyamah on Surah uh, the Resurrection Allah is describing the believers on that day as he said faces on that day will be brightened looking at their Lord how could they say that you won't see Allah on that day when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala himself says it. And we say what the Quran says and the hadith says with the likes of the statement of Allah that the Jews say Allah's hands are tied up, their hands are tied up. Or the statement the heavens are folded up in his right hand. And ayah and hadith like this, we don't add anything on it and we don't explain it but we stop where the Quran and the Sunnah stops. And here he quotes the statement of a Tirmidhi and his Sunan, where he says, <coughs> Imam a Tirmidhi rahimahullah, he says, more than, one peop- more than one person from the people of knowledge, they say about this hadith and other hadith or narrations that are similar to this about the characteristics of Allah, like him descending, tabarak wa ta'ala, uh, to the lowest heaven, Every night they say the narrations are authentic pertaining to this and we believe in it and we're not suspect of these narrations nor do we disbelieve in them nor do we say how. Imam Al-Tirmidhi continues as he says this is what this position was narrated on Malik and Sufyan ibn Uyayn and Abdullah ibn Mubarak that they said pertaining to the likes of these hadith, we read them without asking how. And this is the statement of the people of knowledge from Ahl sunnah wal Jama'ah. As far as the Jahmiyyah, or those who have denied these nar- and rejected these narrations, and they say that this is resembling Allah to His creation, then Allah Azza wa Jalla had mentioned in more than one place in His book that He has a hand and hearing and a sight and the Jahmiyyah, they all say that these ayat in their interpretation of them means and their interpretation against the uh, tafsir of the people of knowledge they say indeed Allah did not create Adam with his hand and they say indeed what is meant by the hand is power and as Haqib ibn Ibrahim he says that you resemble Allah to His creation when you say Allah's hand is like some other hand or Allah's hand resembles another hand or His hearing is like that hearing or His hearing resembles another hearing So when you say his hearing resembles another hearing or is like another hearing, then this is resembling Allah to his creation. But when you say, as Allah Ta'ala himself says, 
a hand and hearing and sight and you don't say how and you don't say like another hearing or it resembles another hearing then how could this be resembling Allah to his creation? Rather it is as Allah Ta'ala says in his book لَيْسَ كَمِثْلِهِ شَيْءٌ وَهُوَ السَّمِيعُ الْبَصِيرُ Nothing resembles him and he is a Samir al-Basir or the all-seeing, the all-hearing. <clears throat> and then the Shaykh refers us to other books that explain this issue in detail. And the Shaykh al-Humaydi, he says, Ar-Rahman wa al istawa Allah says that Ar-Rahman is high, rose high above his throne. And that's in Surah Tutaha, verse number 5. So whoever thinks other than this, then he is a Mu'attal al-Jahmi. The Shaykh Fawaz, he says that our Lord, uh, the Majestic, rose high above his throne. And that this Aqeedah has been established in the Qur'an and the Sunnah and by the consensus of the scholars of the Salaf and the people of Hadith. And this description of being high is a description that has been affirmed from the characteristics of Allah. And that many books have been written establishing the highness of Allah. And you can refer to some of those books. And then he said that these big scholars have compiled the evidences of the Qur'an and the Sunnah and the Ijma' to establish this characteristic of Allah. And then the Shaykh he goes on to say, and we do not make the statement that the Khawarij make when they say, whoever commits a major sin has disbelieved. And the Shaykh he says, I want you to know, may Allah show his mercy on you and show his mercy on us, that this chapter of making Muslims a kafir or not making Muslims a kafir, and then this chapter has caused a lot of fitna and severe trials for the Muslims and has made a lot of division and has separated the ranks of the Muslims and they were separated by the people who follow their own desires and their own opinions and the people who oppose evidences and a group of the people they say that we will not make anyone who is a Muslim a kafir and they make this general negation even though some of the people who are Muslims outwardly are munafiks for real and a group of the people they say that we will make a Muslim a kafir for any sin that he commits and some of them say we will only make him a kafir for a major sin if he commits it and both of these positions are incorrect and the position of Ahl Sunnah they all agree that the one who commits a major sin is not considered a kafir with the type of kufr that will take him all the way outside of Islam as the Khawarij say and Al-Humaydi he continues as he says and we do not make uh, the Muslims kufar because of sins but we say that kufr is leaving the five pillars of Islam that the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said when he said Islam is based on five pillars to bear witness to la ilaha illallah and that Muhammad is the Messenger of Allah to establish the salat, to pay the zakat, to fast the month of Ramadan and to make hajj to the house and that hadith is collected by Al-Bukhari and Muslim and as far as leaving three of these pillars then there's no debate in them and that is leaving off the shahadatain and leaving off the salat and the fasting and that is because they cannot be delayed outside of their time and it's not sufficient for someone to make them up after he intentionally left them off at the times that they were supposed to be performed and as far as the zakat then whenever a person gives it is sufficient for him and if he delays the paying of his zakat then he is a sinner and as far as the one as far as hajj is concerned then whoever it is an obligation for and he has the ability to do so and it is an obligation for him then it is not an obligation for him in that year until he finds no other escape except to make the hajj or whatever the shaykh intends so whenever he performs the hajj then it is sufficient for him and he is not a sinner 
for delaying the Hajj after he has performed it like the performance, like being a sinner and delaying the zakat. And that is because the zakat is the right of the poor Muslims uh, that he has held back from them. And if he does so, then he would be a sinner until the wealth had given, had come to them. And as far as the Hajj is concerned, then it is something that is between a person and his Lord. And if he does performs it, then he has fulfilled his obligation. And if he dies having the ability to make Hajj and didn't make Hajj, then he's going to ask for another turn to come back to this world to make the Hajj. And it's compulsory for his family to make the Hajj for him after him. And we hope that this will be accepted for him as they pay the debts for him after his death. Uh, the Shaykh is uh, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala uh, knows best. It seems like he's making a difference that if you delay the Hajj that you're a sinner while you're delaying it but once you perform the Hajj then all of those years that you delayed it you weren't considered a sinner in those years so long as you performed that hajj as opposed to the zakat that you were a sinner for delaying the paying of it because it wasn't yours it was supposed to be given to them so when you paid your zakat all right now you fulfilled your obligation and you're no longer a sinner but you were at the time when you had delayed the people of giving them their right Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows best. Wa sallallahu wa sallam wa baraka ala nabiyyina Muhammad wa ala ali wa sahbihi wa sallam. And that was the aqeedah of the Imam al-Humaydi rahimahullah. I don't know if there were any questions or comments on this aqeedah. They calling that man? That's not related to the aqeedah though. You're just saying that. I don't know if there were any uh, questions or comments or points around the Aqeedah of Al-Humaydi. No. Uh, no. Here the Shaykh is just referring to the five pillars of Islam, not to anything other than that. No. No. Uh, this book is a collection of the small thesis on Aqidah from some of the Imams of the Salaf. Uh, no, we don't usually sell that many Arabic books in our bookstore. No. Uh, but after tonight, they'll sell the English translation on the tape there, inshallah. And some of the books that are written in Arabic. We do them in the class and then make them available by tape. And then some of the books amongst the ones we had already mentioned were uh, written in book form and available. Naam alhamdulillah. Inshallah. Uh, Inshallah. Uh, ask them at the bookstore then, inshallah. Yeah. I just wanted to uh, remind myself and the brothers and the sisters that the aqidah of the salaf and the aqidah that every Muslim should believe in has only a few points. As Al Humaydi Rahimahullah, he has only 10 points to this aqidah. And many of the ulama, they have 10 points or less to the aqidah that the Muslims should hold and believe in and can feel that they are a good Muslim and their belief is proper and correct. With this being the case, how can so many people be astray? If Islam is so easy, how can so many people be astray? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala always make us from amongst those people who are guided. And may He make our aqidah firm and our hearts and let us die on this aqidah of the salaf. Naam. Are what too long to name? Are the points too long to name? We just named them when we read the Aqidah. No. 
I was just saying, if you, if you count them up, you find that it's only 10 points that are mentioned. No. No, I like that. Some of them, they even make it real shorter, uh, real short, like the Aqidah of Sufyan ibn Uyayna. He just lists it. The Sunnah is 10. That's it. And uh, others of them, they did it in the form like Al Humaydi, did it like a little discussion in last week with Sufyan. Uh, authority, he did a little longer one. Inshallah ta'ala, <clears throat> I think we had did aqeed in the past of Abdullah at Tustari, and he has, he says his aqeed is 10, and it's actually 11 points that he men- mentions. I think we did his aqeed before. And we want to do another aqeed where he says that the aqeed is 6 points. He says the aqeed is 6 points. I don't know if I had that with me today. No, I didn't have that. Uh, no. Brother, he says, suppose somebody has 10 points and somebody has 6 points and Imam al Tahawi has 98 points or whatever. <coughs> uh, uh, some of the ulama emphasize some points and then other points are emphasized, and then some of them are brief, and others of them are more detailed. But I just wanted to make the point that if you get these few points down, that you can feel your Islam is okay, inshallah, and that Islam isn't too difficult for somebody to understand. And this was the purpose of choosing the likes of these small aqidas Because sometimes the people make the innocent, everyday people feel like it's so much knowledge of this deen, I don't even know if I'm Muslim or not. Some people. <laughs> no, you can feel like that. You just say, man, I, I, can't, I don't know all that stuff. No, I mean, it's a lot of stuff, but if you get down a couple of points, you can feel comfortable that you know Islam. Yes, there's a lot of stuff in Islam, and it's a lot of details and what have you, but the masses of the Muslims, if they get a few points down, they'll be okay. They can get five, six points, ten points down then inshallah the aqidah is straight and their deen is okay. So what excuse do you have for Muslims are straight? If they only had to get six points down, what excuse can you make for them if they are straight? No. What excuse are you going to make for people who didn't get ten points down of his deen? What kind of excuse can you make for them? No, may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala help us. And we saw this in the position of Sufyan ibn Uyayna rahmatullahi alayhi when he was explaining to his brother that the aqidah increases and decreases his brother said nah don't say it decreases it just increases and then he got angry with his brother and said it decreases until it ain't no iman and we see that the, uh, the imams of the salaf they used to defend the points of this aqidah they used to defend the points of these aqidahs, and they had no problem saying somebody was astray. Like they say, whoever says the Qur'an is created is a mubtadir. They didn't have no problem saying that somebody was deviant if they strayed from these few points. If you stray from the few points that you need to know about Islam, how can somebody say you're guided? Well, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala guide us. No. No. You say the Qur'an is the speech of Allah and not created. No. The Iman increases and decreases. Oh, I said the Aqid increases and decreases instead of the Iman. Oh, Jazakallah khairan. No, the Iman increases... The iman increases and decreases. No. Subhanakallahumma wa bihamdika shalom la ilaha la anta astaghfiruka wa tubi ilaykum alhamdulillah.